Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 22. You may remain seated. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near, and no one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls, fierce bulls roaring, have hemmed me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My, su- my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. O Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life from these dogs. Snatch me from the lion's jaws and from the horns of these wild oxen. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming to the pregame sermon. Um, I'm not picking, uh, I'm like Pastor Dan, I'm not picking a side. I, I'm going to go for the refs because do you know that ref number four um, is a teacher, right? Is a teacher? Or athletic director at Seattle Christian Schools. So, uh, you know, look and see if he makes the right decisions, okay? We're praying God will help him make the decisions. We want the right team to win. Now, the game's kind of like relates to the sermon because you're going to be waiting, just like David was waiting, on, waiting for God to act. We're waiting for the game to end to know who wins, right? And uh, both teams are kind of waiting too. So um, anyway, thanks for being here. Um, we're in this fourth part of our series on a hunger for the holy. And uh, these books, I don't know if they're still available, but you can, some people are reading the book and some people have the study guide because they have it in their small groups. But uh, Calvin Miller's book, uh, Hungry for the Holy, and we're on chapter four, or four, Psalm 22, and Pastor Keith said, make sure that you announce the fact that next week it's 42, Psalm 42. So if you don't have the, the book and you want to read ahead of time, Psalm 42. How's that sound? Um, well, before I start, let me, let me pray for the words of God to be shared today. Christ, we, Father God, we ask you to use the words that you have uh, prepared ahead of time and those that you bring to my mind uh, even as... Uh, we speak together here today. May you be uplifted. May we recognize that you are the source of all good, that you are the source of the answers to our prayer, and you will answer prayer in your time and in your way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now I want to introduce you to David, but he's kind of slouching a little bit here. We got to put, this is David here today. Um, so, yeah, David. 
Now, next time I preach, maybe I'll speak on Job, you know, and you get both sides of the deal. How's that sound? So today's David. Anyway, um, David, we know he was the son of Jesse, and Jesse, after David, came the line that led up to the birth of Christ. Very interesting that, that, ha that uh, David has such a prominent place to play uh, in leading up to Christ's birth. And, and David had, you know, he had an off and on life, as you know, but yet he was a man after God's own heart. That's what scripture tells us. Um, I want to tell you, if you want to know, learn about more about David, I recommend you go to First and Second Samuel. That's the best place. But there is a book that has really impacted my life. It's by Alan Redpath. It's called The Making of a Man of God. And this, this, is, this tells you how old I am. This is a 1962 version, so it goes back a while. But they have updated it, and it's in paperback. So The Making of a Man of God by Alan Redpath. Fantastic, fantastic book. Um, today we're looking uh, at Psalm 22, and I think when we look at stories, this is a story, but it doesn't have a context. We don't know what the context is. It could be when Saul was chasing after David for his life because he was jealous of David. Uh, remember, he came back, and the words were, um, Paul has slayed his thousands, and David his, David his ten thousands and that's when Saul started getting jealous and he even though David came to him to play the harp for him I guess this way play the harp for him to quiet him down when he was in his temper tantrums and things that were happening because he was being uh, he was being really uh, what do you say uh, pressed upon by uh, the difficulties in his life and they were difficult for him so uh, David came and played the harp, but also we know that, that Saul, uh, David went to Saul and said, you know, there's, I know this war is going on with the Philistines, and there's uh, Goliath out there, and uh, do you know that I killed, uh, killed bears and lions when I was uh, dealing with sheep uh, to keep them away and protect from the sheep and to protect them? And so that was what, even though he was small, he convinced Saul that he would be the one to go out there he went out there and he didn't have armor, as you know. He just took the slingshot and the stone and down was Goliath. Um, at least he got him down so he could cut his head off and really kill him. I mean, he was gone. He's a goner. So we find David at a point where he's questioning God. He comes here and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken or why have you, uh, we would say, abandoned me? He feels he's experiencing God as being indifferent and really distant to him. He feels like God has really taken him and put him out and dropped him far away from where he was. And here's David. All along, the Spirit of God is there with him. But David is feeling like, oh, man, God, you are so far away from me. Um... And I don't know if God really did that. I think God was always there, but David just didn't. Uh, it was a waiting experience that we're going to talk about as to how uh, he, he got his prayer answered. Uh, we didn't get there in the first service, so hold on to your seat because uh, we're going to take you for a ride today. It might be a little longer than you thought. No, no I mean, I, I'm not going to discourage you. You get home for the game. Don't worry. So, um, so David's in this, this place where he feels God has dumped him, he's separate from him, he's crying for help, he's calling day and night on God, and yet um, God isn't answering. He thinks. He's waiting. He, at night he tosses and turns in his bed and he's thinking, oh my goodness, um, is God really there? And if he is there, does he care? Where is this God that I believe in? And tonight, today, if we took him to a psychiatrist, they probably would say he was clinically depressed. Um, he was really down. He was down and, and really feeling bad. Uh, but then this depression, this depression moves to an upward swing, a movement of uh, having more strength behind him. He thinks about the days of his forefathers and that God provided for them. And he provided for them instantly. 
It wasn't like they had a wait. Why did they, what, why am I here doing this when my history behind me is that you answer right away, God? And uh, they were never, these relatives were never disregarded or disgraced. And maybe this was a reminder to David to, to, uh, the, of the fact that um, he can trust God no matter what the situation. He can trust God no matter what the situation. Unfortunately, what happened is any assurance that he might have handed turned into and was followed by doubt and despair. So now he's on this downward swing. He regards himself as less than human. He talks about being a worm, a worm on the ground that is, in his mind, insignificant and worth nothing. Sign of humiliation. And he, where he is holy, he, where God is holy, he thinks, I'm lowly. He's even sarcastically taunted by his enemies. He's sarcastic. Oh. Oh, they boo him, they shake their heads at him, they point their fingers and they sneer and they snicker and Oh my Wow. How would you feel? Pretty depressed, right? But David, for some reason, he gets on an ascending feeling of replacing those downward feelings with something that gives him a little bit of strength. And what it is, is um, he reminds himself that God was with him all the time. As a matter of fact, he wrote Psalm 139 where it talks about how God had knitted him in his mother's womb and has made him and would be his protector and provider for life. He thinks of this and it gives him a, you know, a little bit of more of encouragement. But then what happens? He calls on the Lord because he's in this danger zone now again and trouble is near and he is acknowledging that God is the only one who can help him. God is the only one who can help him. So what happens though is he gets into one of these again downward swings you know it's this up and down downward to loneliness and helplessness and by this time you know he had these up and downs it could be that he with today would maybe be described as bipolar but he wasn't bipolar we have these incidents in our life for periods of time I do myself you do where it's you're on a high and then all of a sudden something happens and you wonder why am I sliding down why am I kind of in this depressed state for a while? And then I think we come back up. God provides for us to get back into the swing of things. I think that's what David was really in. But then he finds himself, he's pitted against these wild animals, and their strength and their cruelty is what he's concerned about. Remember, he had the experience with the bears and the lions, and he knew how ferocious they were after his sheep and how he came and killed them. So I think there's... Um, Figuratively, figure, figurative speech here when he talks about the bulls and the lions and the snarling dogs that are around him. Uh, his enemy is vicious and relentless and on top of the attack he finds himself physically uh, hurting as well and emotionally drained. He feels that his life is slipping away and that he's on the edge of death. He's a weakened person. The physical images that he mentions, he talks about his body as water is going out of his body, the, the vital fluids of life are draining away and they result in dryness. And so he's got this dry mouth where his tongue is kind of sticking to the upper roof of his mouth. He also has, dislo he talks about dislocated bones. But then he talks about an emotional image too. He gives it to us in that he says his heart, um, he has a heart of melted wax. Um, I guess we could say probably that, uh, and this isn't a pun, but he's burnt out. He's burned out. Um, he's just no more energy left. He sees his enemies, his thugs, and uh, they're ganging up on him. They're pinning him down. They're going to pin him down. They're going to take his wallet, and they're going to um, throw dice to determine whose clothing, who gets his clothing. Doesn't that sound familiar when you think of the crucifixion? Some of the same wording in Psalm 22 comes up with Christ. 
In desperation, then he puts himself totally before the Lord. He, he, want, he depends on the Lord's sufficiency, and he says to the Lord, You're my strength. Come quickly and help me. Save me from the sword, the bulls, the lions, and the dogs. Now, before I get to, to um, we talk about your story a little bit, I mean, you're not going to tell us about it, but you're going to think about it. I want to share a little bit from my story. Um, I was on a team uh, in one of my jobs, occupations I had in the past with a, a team of people that had a boss, and um, even on the first day that I was employed by this employer, the boss had told me, he says, you know, there's this guy over here that just isn't worth his, you know, keep. What do you tell him? What do you tell him? a new employee about somebody like that. That's not good. It makes you think, uh, what am I going to be like someday on this guy's list? Well, one day he had a chance to bring this guy down, and it was not really, um, I, I didn't believe sufficient reasons, and I don't think it was the right thing to do. His wife calls me up and says, uh, Dave, will you go with me to talk to the boss? I'm going to represent my husband, and I want a third party there. Well let me know she says and I'm thinking yeah, get, thank you, give me, thanks for giving me some time on this I went home and talked to Sue and we we talked about it. the first thing she said to me well what do you want to do Dave do you want to be political or personal Ugh. I wanted to be personal so I went with her I went with this uh, wife to talk to this boss and uh, sure enough I was labeled after that I was, it was some kind of target to cause me to have to look behind my back and um, it was a miserable experience for me. So what it came down to for me was a matter of uh, integrity after being talked. I was being talked about uh, my loyalty and all this and that. And I just couldn't, couldn't stay at this place. And I did exactly what I tell people when I'm doing career counseling is you never leave a job before you have a job. But I went against my, I went against that. <laughs> Oh boy, so here I am, I'm wondering, now what do we do, God? So we're praying as a family, and a month later, I'm in a new position. So that's fantastic. So then I go on, and I have another position. The last nine years, I'm called into the boss's office, and he says, well, um, sorry to have to tell you this, but uh, there's no place for you here anymore. Well, what's the reason? Well, they kind of use my age as a reason. Um, but anyway... I was told, you're, you're gone, you're out of here. So my family, my family was hurting, I think, more than I was hurting. I think I was working things through, but my family, they're, they're taking a hard hit on this thing because they're uh, my girls and uh, Sue. Um, I just knew it was hard on them. And, it, and we kept praying and we kept asking God, I kept looking for places of, that would fit the call that God has on my life. And um, it took two and a half years. I hate to discourage some of you because I hear some of you have these uh, months thing. I think maybe some people may have a longer time. But in this economic situation we're in, there's people without work, and you are out there. And um, I'm sure there are depressive times that you have. When I left, though, that uh, first time I left on my own volition when I left on the second time it was not on my volition so there are two different situations that were really hard on us but then after two and a half years I get this um, opportunity to interview here at Kent Covenant Church uh, my second time I interviewed because I, I for those of you who don't know I had been here 22 years ago and I was here about five years and then I I thought it was going on to greener pastures uh, that really weren't greener. Um, sometimes we think that. And I, I did come back and I was so grateful to come back to a place I know and to know the staff and to know the love of this church and you guys out there. So it's been great to be here the two and a half years I have been here, but um, uh, it's just uh, to let you know that uh, it was a long time. To get to that, to get to the place where I was uh, accepted after being interviewed and everything took place to come here, I kind of felt like I was the prodigal pastor because having been here and done this little sowing phys uh, spiritual oats, I'm coming back home. You know, um, I guess I was recalled to uh, to Kent Covenant. Maybe that's how you put it. You're called and recalled. But it's been a wonder, one wonderful time here to um, to minister and. 
with God's call in my, my life, how would I know that some of these things would take place in my life? Why would God put me in such places? Um, and I want us to look at um, Romans 5, 3 to 6, and I don't have it for you on the screen, but if you've got a Bible or if you just, you just have to be an auditory learner now, Romans uh, 5, 3 to 6, because this is, this is, this is helpful. Um, Paul is in a bunch of struggles and downward times, and he says in Romans 5, 3, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to, to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. We need to remember that we are in the world and for those who believe in our uh, followers of Jesus Christ Jesus said in John 16 33 in the world you will have trouble in the world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world so Christ in you has overcome the world now let's move on to your story um, what place are you at right now what's the thing that you are waiting for God to do I'm sure everyone has something on their list and I give you a place there in your notes to put something uh, you don't have to do it all now but you know what that thing is and you can list that what that is that you're waiting on God for we're waiting for God to act in relationship to our requests for some of you it's like me employment uh, maybe you're waiting on uh, some healing for you or for a friend. It could be the return of a prodigal son or prodigal daughter. It could be waiting on the acceptance letter from the college you want to go to. It could be waiting to see someone that's in your life experience to change. Now there's no promises there, but God answers prayer and if he doesn't change the person, he can change your attitude towards the person. So. He does answer prayer, but sometimes it comes in different ways. Um, whatever it is, um, I'd like you to list that and then to, you don't have to do it today, but, but take, do this little exercise, list that, and then what is, how is it affecting you physically, like David had the physical effects? How is it affecting you emotionally? And how is it affecting you spiritually? Um, and put these, put these feelings before God. Just as, just as David did. That's the encouragement about David. When I look at his life, because he stumbled, he made a lot of mistakes, and yet he was the man after God's own heart. So God is there to forgive us when things go in the wrong direction of our, in our decision-making and making bad choices. So God is there, and I want you to, to just think about that those parts of your life and even if you think about it today and there's something that's really on your heart there's a prayer partner that'll be here and when two or more are gathered together to prayer God is in their midst and he hears and answers prayer so I just want you to know that sometimes God doesn't answer with the green light the yes sometimes he answers with the red light the no and then the tough one that we're talking about today is the yellow light the caution light, the waiting light, to see what God has in store, how he's in, how, what time period is he going to do this in. The, event, the answer eventually ends up uh, yes, no, or wait some more. <laughs> that's, that's what we're stuck with. But God is faithful and will complete the work that he started us, in us until the day of Christ Jesus. So whatever the final answer is and however long it takes, God knows what is best and he'll work that out in our life. When we're waiting sometimes, God, we see God as being silent. He's not absent or far away even though it might seem like it. Like with this candle, God's, God's there even though we think he may be far away or he has dumped us. Even though... Um, 
you're discouraged, think of the Israelites who waited between the Old Testament and the New Testament 400 years. Now, I'm sure they all didn't live that long, but they were waiting for Christ for a long time until he came. This is a good time to say our memory verse for the week. We didn't, so I think it should be behind us, and it's at the bottom of your notes in, on the second page. So um, I want you to, let's say this together. It's um, been shortened a little, little, but it gets the concept that we want to get across, and I think it's great. So let's say it together. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Deuteronomy 31.8. We'll do it one more time. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be, do not be discouraged. Now I want to get you back to David for the rest of the story. Um, if you're old enough, you remember Paul Harvey. He always said on the radio, and now the rest of the story, but... I'm sorry, I'm not getting the new generation in on that, but um, anyway, the rest of the story, I want to tell you first that David's answer of prayer was, uh, his prayer was answered. Um, this is where you guys are lucky, you get the full sermon, the full meal deal, the whole enchilada where I had to go to communion, and I do have to go to communion soon, I know that. But let me get you through the rest of the story, how's that? The rest of the story, when I look at verse 20, uh, 24, let's see. The 20, verse 24 reads this. I hope it's 24. Yeah. For, all, for he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened to their cries for help. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I do have this interlinear Hebrew Bible. So I go and look at that verse, and it makes it much more clear to me, even though I don't know the Hebrew. But I look at verse 24, and it says, um, I will declare that you have answered me. No, I was, I was hoping Lynn Convert would be here so I could ask him. He's the translator. Why in the world didn't that get in here? I don't know. But that's real specific, saying that David was answered. He was relieved of this torment and this suffering that he was going through. So God was faithful. Now, how does David go about waiting on God? That's a different part of waiting. You, we wait for something but we wait on God. We serve God. How do we go about serving? David said he will honor God and serve him by proclaiming God's name. In other words, he'd tell others about God. By praising, second, he, told, he said he would praise God before others. So giving praise to God before others. And third, he said he would fulfill the vows that he has made before the Lord. And fourth, he said by encouraging others, he would encourage others to praise God, to honor God, and to show reverence and respect for him. So as God answered David's prayers and the prayers of his ancestors, um, and now he answers the prayers of us who wait and serve the Lord. And there's a promise in verse 30 and 31, which I really like, so I'm going to read it. It says, our children will also serve him. Our children will also serve or, or wait on him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born, and he, they will hear about everything he has done. That's the promise that goes on to the next generation. I think it's so appropriate as we've read these verses for now that we come to this time of communion together. We come uh, to receive the bread and the cup that represents the death of Christ, his, his body that was given for us, the blood that was shed on our behalf. And it's so appropriate, I think, as we've talked about this passage to see these, these points and, and, and things that are said in this passage that relate to the crucifixion, 
the pouring out of the, the water of, of Christ's body. His, his fractured legs, the dryness on his mouth. We commemorate that and think about that when we come to the Lord's table, recognizing all he did for us to give his life that we might have salvation through Jesus Christ's death. And that is offered to you today if you're not a believer in Christ. You just can come to him by asking him to come into your life, to forgive your sins and to be a part of you. So join us now as we partake together as a body of Christ in, this last, in the Lord's Supper and thinking about this communion service. Today we'll come forward for communion and you'll be served the bread and the juice. You may take them together here at the front or take them to where you're sitting uh, and take the elements then. We have the option of gluten-free um, bread, which is marked in the baskets. Um, if you are unable to make it up here after we're all done, you can raise your hand and we will serve you um, individually. And in the balcony, the station, you will move from left to right aisles. If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to participate at the table. You don't have to be a member of this church, but if you love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you are welcome. This morning, there would be prayer partners up here that I mentioned earlier, and if you've got some kind of a need, something you're waiting on, waiting for. I mean, come and talk and pray because there's power in prayer when there's two together and praying. Communion is a time to reflect about the sacrifice of Christ that was given for our sins and to give thanks. It also calls us to look forward to the wonderful celebration of eternal life in God's kingdom. Through the, these common elements everyday elements of bread and juice, Christ meets us spiritually to support our faith and to renew our hope. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he had given thanks for it, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. In the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is, take of this juice, of this and as long as you take it, as many times as you take it, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes as you take communion. Let, me, let us pray. Lord, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you and we present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts and that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his death and resurrection that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subject and under, subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly feast where with your saints we will be gathered in glory everlasting. We think of our, our friend, J.B. Still, who's now in your presence. We give you thank for his, thanks for his life. And we ask you to be with Carmen and the extended family as they grieve this loss. And us that know, knew him as we go through that process as well. So it's through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation the head of the church and the author of our salvation that we come. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Eat and drink the body and blood of Christ that has been given for you.